Good afternoon. <laughs> so I'm here to pose the question, what if we could make fuels from sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could take these things on the left-hand side uh, of that chart and use them to to run our society, the things that we like to do on, on the right-hand side, to run our appliances, run our cars, run our airplanes. Wouldn't that be fantastic? And before I actually answer that question, let's back up and ask a different question. So, you know, why, why would we want to do this? And I think that we probably all recognize that there are many, many problems with the way that we run energy today. And pick your poison. It could be uh, that you're most concerned uh, about rising CO2 levels and, and climate change, which is one which is particularly near and dear to my heart. You may be concerned about all the uh, types of pollution that occur when we uh, uh, drill for fossil fuels. Um, uh, you may be concerned about nuclear power plants and the safety associated with them all of these concerns. And it's very easy to get caught up talking about the problems with the way that we do energy today. And what I'd like to do is, is go back to this possibility that there might be a solution out there. And what could that solution be? Well, we know that we have, in fact, an enormous resource base in the sun. In fact, and, and some of you may have heard this statistic, one hour of sunlight on the Earth is equivalent to all of the energy consumption on the planet in one year. We just don't know how to harness that sunlight very well. I mean, we're, we're trying, we do it, but one hour of sunlight is one year's worth of energy consumption. So clearly that's, that's the area where we should be putting our effort. It's not to say that things like wind and uh, tidal and hydro are not useful things to do. Uh, but it's simply to say, look, here's one that is enormous in its potential. And so let's, let's take advantage of that enormous potential. And I like to say, this is like having your nuclear power plant 150 million kilometers away. <laughs> so I, I'm not really uh, worried about uh, disposal of waste from that particular nuclear power plant. So. You know, we do this today. I mean, there are a few uh, solar cells that I've seen here in Bermuda. Um, and this is a picture of Caltech students um, putting up a solar cell on top of one of our parking structures. Uh, we know how to do this. Uh, we do it reasonably well. And you might argue, well, is, isn't the problem solved if, if we simply put in solar cells? And solar cells are a great idea. Uh, but there are two challenges associated with them. One is the fact that you, you probably recognize that sunlight has lots of different uh, colors associated with it, and all of those different colors have a different wavelength, which means they have different energies associated with them. And a typical solar cell only uses a very small portion of that solar spectrum. It has an ability only to capture a small amount of that energy. So that inherently makes it not a very efficient process. And the other uh, challenge with using solar cells, um, and we would encounter that on a day like today, which I was very disappointed with, is that we have clouds. <laughs> and so uh, you obviously would not be able to run your, your entire society, your infrastructure, uh, relying on having uh, sunshine when you need it. So what is the way that we'd like to get around this? Well, first of all, we'd like to solve for the fact that we have uh, clouds simply by storing the energy. And there must be some way to store the energy. And uh, the most common way, of course, if you take your solar cell, is to charge up a battery. And you can say, well, I should be able to do storage in that way. I should be able to you know, build enough batteries. And again, it, when I say the uh, comparisons with different approaches, I don't want it to sound like I don't think those are good ideas, and we should try to make batteries better. But what I want to point out to you is that for our best lithium batteries, the um, size of the storage, uh, if you compare that to gasoline, chemical energy storage, the volume is eight times as much, the weight is 16 times as much, and so if you think about driving a car, it, it just becomes infeasible. And many of you know that electrical, electric vehicles have a relatively short range because of the 
problems with batteries. And now if you think about backing up an entire electrical grid using batteries, it becomes just incredibly daunting. And so we say, well, look, chemical fuels have inherently so much energy in those chemical bonds, wouldn't that be the way to do the storage? We've done that. We have an existing energy infrastructure that knows how to handle liquid chemical fuels. So what we'd like to do then is come up with a solution that uses that entire solar spectrum all the way from those very high energy blues to those very low energy reds, uses that whole thing and converts that sunlight into a liquid fuel. That's the goal. And so how do we do it? Well, the first part in terms of using the entire solar spectrum, uh, and I was hoping to get a picture of my kids, but California also had uh, some uh, cloudy days, so I could not have staged a, a meaningful picture here. So this is a, just a picture taken from the web, but some of you have probably played with a magnifying lens, and if you were mischievous, you were trying to light an ant on fire. If you were less mischievous, you are maybe just trying to light a piece of paper on fire. Um, but the idea is you can capture all of that sunlight, uh, and the, I don't know if you can see the rays there, but the idea is that you're focusing all the sunlight to one point and you're creating heat. And this kind of a process is useful because it uses the entire solar spectrum. And so we're kind of doing brute force chemistry, which is to say, just take all of those photons and make it into heat. And now, if we have that heat, we can use it to drive chemistry. And so the chemistry that I'm going to show you now, please bear with me, we have a bit of chemical reactions. Uh, and I have to say, it's true that my kids do really like science, especially my nine-year-old has been asking me to get him a periodic table for his room. Um, I managed to find a t-shirt for him, but I haven't found a really uh, beautiful periodic table for his room. So we're going to do a little chemistry here. So the chemistry, oh, but let me back up and say, so, you know, of course we want to, you know, do this, we want to collect that solar spectrum, but we have to do it in a way that, you know, of course we need a little more heat than just lighting up an ant on fire. I mean, we need more heat than that. Uh, so we are going to come up with these big uh, solar arrays that now collect that sunlight and put it all into one, uh, one spot so we can do, you know, some very serious chemistry because we have very high temperatures and lots of heat here. So the chemistry that we're going to do is simply to say, um, we're going to, hmm, we're going to have some confused equations, um, but what we're going to do is take some water uh, and dissociate it, split it into hydrogen and oxygen. So this is what we're going to do. Uh, we could, and hydrogen, the thing in the red here, is our fuel. We could do the same analogous chemistry by taking carbon dioxide and splitting it into carbon monoxide and oxygen. So we've just taken one oxygen off that CO2 molecule, and we have CO, which is carbon monoxide. We could do this together. So we have water, and we have carbon dioxide, so that's CO2. The water is, of course, the H2O. And when we take off the oxygen from those molecules, leave behind the hydrogen and the carbon, get those two to come together, then we make CH4, which is methane, which is the primary component of natural gas. So now we're getting into things that we know how to do. And if we have hydrogen and carbon monoxide, uh, in fact, and again, carbon monoxide is a toxin, so we're not going to be using it directly. Um, if you have hydrogen and carbon monoxide, you can make liquid fuels, liquid transportation fuels. So these are our basic ingredients then for making uh, fuels that store solar energy. So these, this is the chemistry that we need to drive. And so how are we going to do it? Well, we have a magic ingredient. Our magic ingredient, now just a little bit more chemistry, is uh, a, um, it's a ceramic, essentially. It's cerium dioxide. And it's a ceramic which has uh, an incredible ability to exhale oxygen at high temperatures. So I was listening to Henley's uh, talk, and I thought, yeah, my, my materials breathe, uh, but not quite in the same way. Uh, but I actually did uh, put this here in terms of a biological context to um, you know, just convey the sense of what happens with these materials. So when you heat a material up, the atoms in the structure, they vibrate. They, they get all this energy. They're vibrating. They're vibrating. And at some point, they're just released 
from the ceramic. But what happens with this magic material is that the rest of the structure stays in place. It doesn't fall apart when it loses a little bit of oxygen. So it gently exhales some oxygen. And that's at high temperature when those atoms are all rattling around and they, um, they just don't want to stay in the structure anymore. And when we cool the material back down, the material says, wait a minute, I have these spots that should have had oxygen in it, and so I want to suck back o oxygen back in. So I'm going to inhale oxygen back in. And so how does this work then in terms of allowing us to make fuels? Well, what it does is it allows us to uh, bring in oxygen and we steal it from a molecule like water, from H2O. And so let me show you the, the animation on this. And so here's our cerium dioxide. This is our crystal structure here. The um, cerium are the... Um, uh, the orange, and the oxygens are the blue. And so we heat this up, those oxygens are rattling, 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 they want to get out of that structure, and there they go. Bye-bye, we've created some oxygen. And now when we cool it back down, we um, have the material saying, um, you know, I, I want to fill those sites back up, I want to inhale, and my only choice to inhale is the oxygen from this water molecule. And so the our magic material then strips the oxygen away from the hydrogen, or away from that hydrogen that was in the water, and releases hydrogen. So this is phenomenally straightforward chemistry. I hope that you were able to follow me with that. Um, and what it is, it, it's actually much simpler, I would say, than the chemistry that um, many folks are trying to pursue in trying to come up with this whole idea of solar fuels. And you know, I was, I was asked, well, well, you know, so why, why, you know, of course, why don't people do this? Well, the challenge with this, and again, um, it made me think of Hanley's talk, is that even the, the chemists in the field have said, well, your materials just don't breathe deeply enough. How can you produce a lot of fuel if you're not taking deep breath? And what we pointed out was, well, they, they breathe really quickly. So it doesn't matter how deeply you breathe if you have a lot of heart a lot of breath that you're taking in a given period of time. And so this magic material has this ability to exhale this oxygen very, very quickly, inhale it back in very quickly, and so we can run many, many, many cycles over a given day, and that's why we're able to produce fuel by this method. And so I just want to leave you with this overall idea that solar energy is abundant, one hour of sunlight is equal to all the energy that we consume on the planet in one year. And, and, and it's, it's mind-boggling to think about that. Um, chemical fuels store energy well. It gets around all of the challenges having to do with batteries, with having to do with battery lifetimes and, and batteries that self-discharge and... Um, just, you know, and again, battery research is something that we ought to be pursuing, but here's a whole nother way to store, uh, store energy for use on demand. And when we use, when we create a, a fuel, a solar fuel as we call it, if we use this process that takes the sunlight and makes heat out of it first, rather than trying to use the individual wavelengths, now we're able to capture the entire solar spectrum and able to use all of it, and, and that is an essential to be able to do things efficiently, um, and, and of course, efficiently means low, lower cost and you know, all the good things, uh, you know, fewer stations that you have to build, everything that's good with using our, our resources more efficiently. And then these designer materials that I've described to you, that is the magic ingredient, really, that allows us to do this. So having uh, these materials that actually can capitalize on that heat to drive these chemical reactions, uh, that's, that's the research that we do in my laboratory, really to de develop these materials uh, to make them even better uh, and be able to make this a, a reality. And so with that, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>